Identity. Identity is said. What is called identity by the Blessed One? Friend Visaka, these five aggregates affected by craving and clinging are called identity by the Blessed One. That is the material form aggregate affected by craving and clinging. Now, what I want to say here is it may be affected by craving and clinging or not. The aggregates can still arise without craving and clinging, especially for an arahat. They have no craving and clinging in their mind ever. So what we're, what we're talking about here is for most laymen, and they are affected by craving and clinging with the five aggregates. The feeling aggregate affected by craving and clinging. The perception aggregate affected by craving and clinging. The formations aggregate affected by craving and clinging. The consciousness aggregate affected by craving and clinging. These five aggregates affected by craving and clinging are called identity by the Blessed One. Saying, good lady, the lay follower of Isaka, delighted and rejoiced in the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina's words. Then he asked a further question. Lady, origin of identity, origin of identity is said. What is the origin of identity by the Blessed One? Friend Visaka, it is craving. That's the origin of identifying with the false belief of I am that. Which brings renewal of, of being is accompanied by delight and lust and delights in this and that. That is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for habitual patterns, and craving for non-being. This is called the origin of identity by the Blessed One. Lady, the cessation of identity. Cessation of identity is said. What is called the cessation of identity by the Blessed One? <clears throat> Friend Visaka. It is the remainderless fading away and ceasing, the giving up, relinquishing, letting go, relaxing, and rejecting of that same craving. That is the cessation of, that is called the cessation of identity by the Blessed One. Lady, the way leading to the cessation of identity. The way leading to the cessation of identity is called. What is the way leading to the cessation of identity by the Blessed One? Friend Visaka, it is just this noble eightfold path. Now, Almost everybody that knows about the Eightfold Path, it's write this and write that. And the Pali word for it is sama, which means correct or right. But I don't really like that word very much because if something's right, then something's wrong, and world the world is black and white. And how often do you see black and white? So instead of using the word right, I change it to harmonious. So we're talking about the harmonious Noble Eightfold Path. When you're in harmony with things, your mind tends towards the wholesome. And 
it says right view. And I change that again and call it harmonious perspective. What is a harmonious perspective? It is seeing everything as being part of an impersonal process. That's what right view is. That's what harmonious perspective is. So every time you use the six R's, what are you doing? Practicing harmonious perspective. It's a very necessary part of the practice and this will take you all the way to arahatship. Now the next part of the Eightfold Path, Bhikkhu Bodhi translated as uh, right intention and I really don't agree with that. So I call it harmonious imaging. Now, most of the translations, they'll say right thought. And that's not quite as accurate as it could be. It's imaging. What kind of an image do you hold in your mind? I'm always broke. As a result, you're always broke because that's the kind of image you keep holding in your mind. If you hold an image of your being prosperous, your having a clear mind, a bright mind, then you will be prosperous with a clear, bright mind. Whatever kind of image you hold about yourself, that's what your mind will produce. I hold an image of being very prosperous. And if you came to my center and saw how beautiful the meditation center is, how uh, nice the, the, uh, the dining hall and the kitchen really are, you would have to say, yeah, it looks like he's pretty prosperous. How did I build something like that? I don't have any money. But by holding the image of being prosperous, we just started doing it and then it materialized. I like to travel. I see myself as a traveling monk. Last year I traveled over 40,000 miles. I travel a lot. I travel all over Asia. This year I'm going to be going to Australia and Japan and Indonesia and possibly Sri Lanka. I don't know for sure yet. We have to wait until the monk comes when we talk. <clears throat> so developing a mind that has a harmonious image is a very important, important aspect it's an important fold of the Eightfold Path. The next part of the Eightfold Path, they call it right speech. And again, I changed that to say harmonious communication. Okay, right speech has a very... Uh, limited idea of saying things that you're not lying, you're not trying to uh, take advantage of other people, things like that. But when it's harmonious communication, that means that you communicate not only with the verbal part of your uh, of your speech, but also your body language, too. Now, who do you talk with more than anybody else in the world? Yourself. 
Are you using harmonious communication towards yourself? Uh-oh. <laughs> so every time there's a negative thought that comes up and you take it personally, you're, pr you're not practicing harmonious communication with yourself. And you cause yourself immeasurable amounts of suffering because of that overcritical mind. You can do 25 things in a day that are absolutely brilliant. They're so nice. It's just, it just makes you feel really good. And you do one thing that your mind says is marginal. What do you think about? It? You think about that one thing, and then you criticize yourself for it and you beat yourself up for it, and you have repeat thoughts about it, guess who has an attachment? And they don't like themselves very much. So it's a real important aspect of the meditation that you have an uplifted mind that is not caught up in critical observations and words. So you need to be mindful of that. You need to be able to see, oh, I'm beating myself up on that one because I didn't do it perfectly. I made a little mistake. So now you can just 6R that. Let that go. One of the things that I did when I was in Malaysia, I had a bunch of students that were very hard on themselves. So I got out some notebooks and I told people, you have to write down 10 good qualities that you sincerely like in yourself. That was hard for them. They couldn't think of anything nice to say about themselves. And they said, well, what kind of things? I said, are you generous? Well, yeah, we'll put that down. Do you like yourself for being generous? Yeah. Good. Now, oh, what else? Eventually, they all got 10 of them down. It, it took a while, but they did it. And then I told them, now I want you to look at each one of these qualities and appreciate yourself for being like that. And the more you appreciate yourself for liking yourself for being a particular way, joyful, happy, smiling, whatever it happens to be, the more you appreciate yourself for being like that, the more you see that in other people. And that makes you happy. So now you're affecting the world around you in a positive way. So this kind of communication is very important. What you do with what you think about yourself. And beating yourself up, don't do that. Okay, the next fold of the Eightfold Path is called Right Action, and I call this harmonious movement. Uh, especially when unwholesome things arise, you have a tendency to try to make them stop, push them away very quickly, so that your mental movement is not in balance. So you let go of that. You don't 
continually jerk your mind around with the things you want to you want to observe you do it in a very harmonious soft way the next part of the eightfold path is called right livelihood and right livelihood according to the definition in the suttas it doesn't really apply don't sell weapons don't sell poisons don't take on slaves these kind of things and it doesn't apply and i've always been curious about that because this was part of the first dhamma talk that the buddha gave was part of the eightfold path now these monks that he was giving this dhamma talk to they weren't going to be doing any of that kind of stuff so it, he was talking about how to develop your mind and this is a physical thing weapons poisons they wouldn't do that sort of thing so i changed this to mean harmonious lifestyle what kind of things do you put in front of your mind you um uh, the the classic example i've given many times you've probably heard it many times this girl came to me she was uh I think she was in her early 20s. And she she said, "You know, I love to do the practice that you're teaching me, but I have these horrible nightmares. And it's really bad." So, I asked the classic question, "Why?" She said, "I don't know, but it seems to happen every time I go to the movies." What kind of movies do you watch? Oh, I love those horror movies. <laughs> so I said, "Well, don't do that anymore." And she said, "But I love it." So I said, "Don't come to me about nightmares. What are you putting in front of your mind?" the next part of the eightfold path the next fold of the eightfold path is right effort i call it harmonious practice because that's what the six r's really are harmonious our uh, right effort has four parts to it you recognize when an unwholesome state arises what's an unwholesome state any state that arises that has craving in it you release that unwholesome state and relax you bring up a wholesome state smile why is smiling so important because your mind becomes very light and that's the kind of mind you need to practice meditation a light mind not a heavy mind like you're walking in the mud you need this light mind that has a sense of happiness in it and bring that mind back to your object of meditation and you repeat staying with your object of meditation for as long as you can stay with the wholesome right effort that is the practice that i'm trying to show you that leads to a pure mind I don't know if you've noticed yet but every time you relax there is 
a brief period of time where there's no thoughts in your mind. Your mind is clear, your mind is very alert and observant, and your mind is pure. Why is it pure? Because you've let go of craving. So harmonious practice is the practice of the six R's. And I got in trouble on the internet one time because I gave them a monk's understanding of the word Nibbana. Ni means no, Bana means fire. The Buddha gave a sermon called the Fire Sermon. And he, he was talking about how, how everything is burning. Burning with what? Burning with craving. So I told them that every time they practiced the six R's, they were experiencing Nibbana. But almost everybody has this idea of this big thing in the sky. Nibbana is something that's way out. Can't really experience it. But you're experiencing it every time you use the six R's. It is mundane. That means it's going to keep coming. This, the craving is not particularly hard to get rid of, or I can't say it that way. It's not particularly hard to let go of, but it is particularly persistent. And it keeps coming back over and over and over again. So you have to keep relaxing into that. This is called the mundane Nibbana. <clears throat> the next fold of the Eightfold Path is called Right Mindfulness. I'll give you the definition again. Remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. That's all mindfulness is, is observing how this process works. And it can go very, very deep into your practice so that you see even small little things starting to arise and you can relax right then. The mindfulness or harmonious observation and the right effort or harmonious practice, they go together very strongly, along with your harmonious perspective. These three are the major parts of the Eightfold Path, if you can call it that. In Sutta number 117 in the Majjhima Nikaya, it explains that in detail. Every link, it always comes back to right effort, right <coughs> mindfulness, right understanding or harmonious perspective. The last fold of the Eightfold Path has been troublesome for as long as Rice Davies has put it in, uh, translated it. It's Sama Samadhi. Samadhi is always translated as concentration. But in this country, concentration is always talking about one-pointed absorption types of practice. During the time of the Buddha, and this is according to Rice Davies too, that the word samadhi was never used before. The Buddha made this word up. 
to describe a very different kind of collected mind that's very aware. But about oh, 200 years after the time of the Buddha, maybe a little bit more, there was a lot of Brahmins that put robes on because they saw that they were the monks were being supported by King Asoka. And they wanted to get the same good food and all of the advantages of doing that. But they didn't really know what the Buddha was teaching. So they were teaching their Brahmin ideas but they were dressed up as monks. Eventually that's, that problem solved itself and they were disrobed and told, don't ever do that again. But because of their influence, their ideas in the Vedas about the word concentration and the word samadhi the definition got changed to absorption concentration. And this also, every time uh, Buddhism would go into another country, they were always practicing one-pointed types of concentration. And rather than fight with them, they went along with it. They tried to and introduce the relaxed step. Some places they did it, some places they didn't. The problem with one-pointed concentration is a few. One, it can be very dangerous. You can get into one-pointed concentration and not know what you're doing and actually die from doing that kind of meditation. One-pointed concentration suppresses all of the hindrances. Not that they're doing it on purpose, but it's the force of the absorption concentration, the one-pointed concentration, that pushes the hindrances down. And they can experience a lot of bliss and very nice states while they're <coughs> in that deep concentration state, but when they come out, <coughs> There's no personality development. There's no uh, seeing how the hindrances arise. As a result, they keep getting caught by the hindrances and they keep doing the meditation in that way and there's no Nibbana because they haven't let go of craving. And a lot of people, I know people that have been practicing meditation for 20, 25, 30 years, and they keep going back to the meditation, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And I think that's what uh, Einstein said was stupidity. <laughs> well... It is both. <laughs> <laughs> but people become very attached to the ways that they're doing things and they think they're doing them according to what the Buddha taught. And actually, there's some problems with that because of the suppression of the hindrances. See, if you don't recognize that tension and tightness, and it's subtle when you first start out, if you don't recognize that and relax it and get in the habit of being able to see it when it arises, well, your meditation is not going to progress very well. I'm quite happy with almost all of you with your meditation. You're progressing very well because you're following the directions. 
and it's because of that one extra step of recognizing that tightness in your head and letting it be, letting it go, relaxing into that. So the word right concentration, I really don't like to use that. And I call this harmonious collectedness. Collectedness is an interesting word. Because it, if you look it up in the dictionary, it also says composed and still. So collectedness not only means just having a mind that comes together, but it also means that it's very still, composed, and alert. This is the difference in jhana practice between the absorption concentration and the tranquility practice. Because you're practicing an aware jhana. When you're practicing absorption concentration, your mind's stuck on one thing. That's it. Doesn't move. Don't know you have a body. And there can be all kinds of problems with this kind of meditation, tinnitus and uh, uh, dizziness, all kinds of things like that can occur from absorption concentration and it never happens when you use that relaxed step. So it's extremely important that you understand the difference between one-pointed concentration a lot of people have been practicing other kinds of meditation and they come up and they say, I don't know whether I'm practicing absorption concentration or not. How can you tell? Are you using the six R's? Yeah, then you're not. You still have some stillness that comes into your mind. So there's no movement of mind's attention at all in some stages. And you can call that concentration, but the kind of concentration that's implied in this country is always the kind of concentration where you are bringing the craving back to your object of meditation, and you wind up with some pretty massive headaches because you're putting in wrong effort. One of the biggest problems I have for people when they first start coming and practicing meditation is they've done it with other teachers and other teachers tell them, you're not trying hard enough. You got to put in more energy. You got to put in more effort. And they wind up with these massive headaches. I know, because I had one. And it was so intense at some points, it was like taking a red-hot needle and sticking it in the middle of my brain. I had such intense pain that it was like you, you bump your head real hard and your eyes water. I, my eyes were watering. I wasn't crying because of the pain, but it caused my eyes to water because it was so intense. Any time you have tightness in your head, you have to back off, back away from what you're doing, and relax. Don't put so much energy into it. Now, one of the reasons that I tell you that it's real important to smile is because that helps you to do that. It helps keep your mind light so you're not trying so hard. You see, I am a sneaky monk. It also makes joy arise. 
when I was practicing straight vipassana in Burma, I'd get to a place in the meditation and after so much pain and so much suffering I went through, I'd get some joy. And I say, yeah, now we're talking. Now this is pretty good stuff. So I'd go to the teacher and I say, I got some joy. And the first thing they said, don't get attached. Well, I didn't want to get attached. So I started pushing the joy away. <laughs> and I got to suffer more because of it. <laughs> what a deal. Joy is one of the awakening factors. It is a good thing to have arise because your mind is light and alert. Very observant when you have joy in your mind. Don't hold on to it. Don't try to make it last longer. You can six R it. That doesn't mean it's going to go away. It means you're letting go of your attachment to it. Again, remember that the six R's are not going, you don't use the six R's to make things stop from happening. It doesn't work that way. The six R's, when you relax and allow that to be there, it can be in a pain in your back, a pain in your neck, whatever it happens to be, it's not going to make that pain go away, but it's going to let go of the attachment to it. And as you relax more and more, those pains start to go away by themselves. <clears throat> okay. Lady, is that craving and clinging the, the same as the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging, or is the craving and clinging something apart from the five aggregates of craving and clinging? Friend Visaka, that craving and clinging is neither the same as the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging. <coughs> nor is craving and clinging something apart from the five aggregates of, affected by craving and clinging. It is the desire and lust in regard to the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging that is the craving and clinging here. Lady, how does identity view come to be? <coughs> Here, friend Visaka, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, regards material form as self or self as possessed of material form or material form as in self, or self as in material form. He regards feeling as self, or self as possessed of feeling, or feeling as in self, or self as in feeling. He regards perception as self, or self as possessed of perception or perception as in self, or self as in perception. He regards formations as self, or self as possessed of formations, or formations as in self, or self as in formations. He regards consciousness as self, or self as possessed of consciousness or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That is how identity view comes to be. Lady, how does identity view not come to be? 
dear friend Visaka, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones, <coughs> excuse me, and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, does not regard material form as self, for self is possessed of material form. And it goes through that whole thing again, which I'm not going to do. Lady, what is the noble eightfold path? Friend Visaka, it is just this noble eightfold path that is harmonious perspective, harmonious imaging, harmonious communication, harmonious movement, harmonious lifestyle, harmonious practice, harmonious observation, and harmonious collectedness. Lady, is the Noble Eightfold Path conditioned or unconditioned? Friend Visaka, the Noble Eightfold Path is conditioned. Lady, are the three aggregates included by the Noble Eightfold Path or is the Noble Eightfold Path included by the three aggregates? The three aggregates are not included by the Noble Eightfold Path, Friend Visaka. But the Noble Eightfold Path is included by the three aggregates. Now this, we're coming to a place where monks have been arguing for the last 2,300 years. Right speech, right action, and right livelihood, these states are included in the aggregate of virtue. Fair enough. The practicers of meditation, they tell you that you have to have all of the Eightfold Path in order to attain Nibbana. The people that are uh, scholars, they say, well, you already are practicing this kind of morality. You don't need that in the Eightfold Path when you're practicing. So they basically say there's five-fold path. You don't need that. You're already practicing right, right speech, right uh, uh, harmonious movement, harmonious lifestyle. Right, uh, harmonious practice, harmonious observation, and harmonious collectedness these states are included in the aggregate of collectedness. Right, or harmonious perspective and harmonious imaging are states that are included in the aggregate of wisdom. Lady, what is collectedness? What is the basis of collectedness? What is the equipment of collectedness? What is the development of collectedness? Unification of mind, friend Visaka, is collectedness. The four foundations are the basis for collectedness. The four kinds of right effort are the equipment of collectedness. The repetition, development, and cultivation of these same states is the development of collectedness. Repetition. How many times do you get to use a 6R in a day? <clears throat> Lady, how many formations are there? There are three formations, friend Visaka, the bodily formation, the verbal formation, and the mental formation. 
But lady, what is the bodily formation? What is the verbal formation? What is the mental formation? In breathing and out breathing, friend Visaka, are bodily formation. Thinking and examining thought are the verbal formation. Perception, feeling, and consciousness are the mental formation. But lady, <clears throat> why are the in and out breathing the bodily formation? Why are thinking and examining thought the verbal formation? Why are perception, feeling, and consciousness the mental formation? Friend Visaka, in breathing and out breathing are bodily. These are states bound up with the body. That is why in breathing and out breathing are bodily formation. Because you have a body, you breathe. That's basically all it's saying. First, one thinks and examines thought, and subsequently one breaks out into speech. Now that can be uh, talking to someone else, or it can be speech in your own head. That is why thinking and examining thought are the verbal formations. Perception, feeling, and consciousness are mental. These are states bound up with mind. That is why perception, feeling, and consciousness are mental formations. <clears throat> Lady, how does the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness come to be? Friend Visaka, when a monk is attaining the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, it does not occur to him, I shall attain the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, or I am attaining the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, or I have attained the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness but rather his mind has previously been developed in such a way that it leads him to that state. Now the cessation of perception and feeling and consciousness, it's like hitting a blank spot. You can't plan on it happening when you want it to happen, it won't. You know, <laughs> you don't know you're in that state when it occurs. You don't know. It just happens. When you get out of that state, you'll reflect, <clears throat> that was a blank spot. There's no perception, there's no feeling, there's no consciousness. Now, when you get to be in some of the higher stages of attainment, either an anagami, which is you have no more lust ever arising in your mind again, and no more hatred ever arising in your mind again. Your mind is pure enough at that time that you can start making a determination for that kind of thing to arise. I'll explain that again in a minute. <clears throat> Lady, when a monk is attaining the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, which state cease in him first? The bodily formation, the verbal formation, or the mental formation. Friend Visaka, when a monk is attaining the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, 
First the verbal formation ceases, then the bodily formation, then the mental formation. Lady, how does emergence from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness come to be? Friend Visaka, when a monk is emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, it does not occur to him, I shall emerge from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, or I am emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness or I have emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, but rather his mind was previously de developed in such a way that it leads him to that state. This is a state where if you are a, an anagami or an arahat, you can sit in this state for up to seven days. And I have run across one person that has done that. And I ask them, why? Why do you want to sit without any perception, feeling, and consciousness for seven days? And they gave me a one-word answer, relief. Ah. You know, you get into the, some of these deeper states and there's no movement of mind's attention at all. What relief that is. But in Indonesia, I have students to this day that they'll sit in that state for an hour, hour and a half, and they go, well, nothing is happening, so they break their sitting and get up and do something. It drives me crazy when they do that. Your mind is so pure. There's so much rest in that kind of state. Why would you want to break that? It's really nice to be able to sit with a mind that doesn't have disturbance in it. So to be able to do that for seven days, there's a lot of relief in that. Now you say seven days, no, they don't break to get a drink of water. They don't go to the bathroom. Actually, their breath becomes very, very, very fine. Their heartbeat is almost non-existence, but their body is alive. And we'll get into that in a bit. <clears throat> Lady, when a monk is emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, which states arise in him first? Bodily formation, verbal formation, or mental formation? Friend Visaka, when a monk is emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, first the mental formation arises, then the bodily formation, then the verbal formation. When a monk has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, how many kinds of contact touch him? Friend Visaka, when a monk has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, three kinds of contact touch him. The voidness contact, the signless contact and the desireless contact. Lady, when a monk has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, 
To what does his mind incline? To what does it lean? To what does it tend? Friend Visaka, when a monk has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, his mind inclines to seclusion, leans to seclusion, tends to seclusion. So when you come out of that, you don't, you don't want a circus around you. Your mind just tends towards being peaceful and calm. But now you're much more aware because you have perception, feeling, and consciousness. Is that is a permanent change? No. It, it just lasts for a period of time and then they get back into their daily stuff. But they do it uh, oh, I asked I asked this lady that could sit for seven days. What was in your mind? What it, what is in your mind? You don't have any lust. You don't have any hatred. Must be pretty nice. And she stopped for a minute, and she said, "Well, there's loving kindness." a lot of collectedness and happiness. Hmm, that's nice. I want one. <laughs> <laughs> I think of how nice life would be if we had neighbors that could get into that kind of state. And every time you saw them, you knew that they were sending you loving and kind thoughts and sincerely wishing you well. Wouldn't that be nice? They never get mad, no matter what happens. Their mind is just in a wonderful state of balance. Okay, now we're going to talk about feeling. Lady, how many kinds of feeling are there? Friend Visaka, there are three kinds of feeling. Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neither painful nor pleasant feeling. But lady, what is pleasant feeling? What is painful feeling? What is neither painful nor pleasant feeling? Friend Visaka, whatever is felt bodily or mentally as pleasant and soothing is pleasant feeling. Whatever is felt bodily or mentally is painful and hurting is painful feeling. Whatever is felt bodily or mentally as neither soothing nor hurting is neither painful nor pleasant feeling. Lady, what is pleasant and what is painful in regard to pleasant feeling? What is painful and what is pleasant in regard to painful feeling? What is pleasant and what is painful in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feeling? Friend Visaka, Pleasant feeling is pleasant when it persists and painful when it changes. Painful feeling is painful when it persists and pleasant when it changes. Neither painful nor pleasant feeling is pleasant when there is knowledge of it and painful when there's no knowledge of it. What does that mean? It means it is pleasant when you have mindfulness that there is a neutral feeling there. That is called equanimity. It is painful when 
you don't pay attention to it. Why is it painful? Because there is no mindfulness and that leads to a mind that has all kinds of nonsense running through it. Uh, one of my teachers from Sri Lanka, he never liked the word to, use, to use the word nonsense. He always said it was rubbish. <laughs> rubbish thoughts. And that's pretty much true, you know. <laughs> How many rubbish thoughts go through your mind in a day? It's because you're not being mindful and using the six R's. Underlying tendencies. What a lady, what underlying tendency underlies pleasant feeling? What underlying tendency underlies painful feeling? What underlying tendency underlies neither painful nor pleasant feeling? Here, friend Visaka, the underlying tendency to lust underlies pleasant feeling. The underlying tendency to aversion underlies painful feeling. The underlying tendency to ignorance underlies neither painful nor pleasant feeling. Lady, does the underlying tendency to lust underlie all pleasant feeling? Does the underlying tendency to aversion underlie all painful feeling? Does the underlying tendency to ignorance underlie all neither painful nor pleasant feeling? Friend Visaka, the underlying tendency to lust does not underlie all pleasant feeling. The underlying tendency to aversion does not underlie all painful feeling. The underlying tendency to ignorance does not underlie all, neither painful nor pleasant feeling. <clears throat> Lady, what should be abandoned in regard to pleasant feeling? What should be abandoned in regard to painful feeling? What should be abandoned in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feeling? Friend Visaka, the underlying tendency to lust. Should be abandoned in regard to pleasant feeling. The underlying tendency to aversion should be abandoned in regard to painful feeling. The underlying tendency to ignorance should be abandoned in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feeling. Lady, does the underlying tendency to lust have to be abandoned in regard to all pleasant feeling? Does the underlying tendency to aversion have to be abandoned in regard to all painful feeling? Does the underlying tendency to ignorance have to be abandoned in regard to all neither painful nor pleasant feeling? Friend Visaka, the underlying tendency to lust does not have to be abandoned in regard to all pleasant feeling. What does that mean? When you're in jhana, there is no lust. Right? Okay. The underlying tendency to aversion does not have to be abandoned in regard to all painful feeling. The underlying tendency to ignorance does not have to be abandoned in regard to all neither painful nor pleasant feeling. Here, friend Visaka, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. 
With that, he abandons lust and the underlying tendency to lust does not underlie that. Here a monk considers thus, when shall I enter upon and abide in the base that the noble ones now enter and abide upon, or abide in? In one who thus generates a longing for supreme liberation, Grief arises. Now, I've been talking about longing for a little bit. Jesus, how much longer do I have to go before I can attain Nibbana? I really <laughs> want to attain Nibbana now. That is an unwholesome kind of thought to develop. And it does cause grief and pain. And it is subtle if you hold on to that thought and then you forget that you're holding on to it. And you get so close in the meditation and all of a sudden you have hindrances just pulling you away all over the place. Why? Because of that longing. It's longing. I really want this to happen. How much longer do I have to practice? Well, that kind of longing will stop you from attaining Nibbana. It will. No doubt about it. What you have to do is practice making a determination before you sit. Whatever arises, it's okay for it to be there. I don't care. Whether Nibbana comes or not doesn't really matter to me at all. That's letting go of the longing. My job as a meditator is just to observe lightly how mind's attention is moving and relax into that. That's my job. That's all. So it's, a, and, and what happens is if you have longing you think you're in the present moment, but you're leaning out of this moment to the next one, hoping that that's the moment it's going to happen. And that causes restlessness to arise. That causes all kinds of, of the disturbances in your meditation. And you might have had that longing a month ago. And you forgot that you had it, but it still is affecting you. So you have to recognize that you can't want anything to happen. It's going to happen the way it's going to happen. When the conditions are right, it will happen. But one of the conditions that stops it from happening is that little leaning out of the present moment because that doesn't have Nibbana in it. Maybe the next one will. <laughs> so you have to make a determination before you get into your meditation and say, it doesn't matter what happens next. My job is just to observe. That's all. I don't care what happens next. That's the kind of attitude that does lead to Nibbana. So you have to let go of that slight little I want. And that's what longing is. I mean, when I started meditating back in the early 70s, 
I had the idea, yeah, I'll go do a meditation retreat, maybe come out with a couple jhanas and nibbana. I'll be a sotapanna in a month. <laughs> How's that work out? <laughs> <laughs> well, 20 years later, I found out that that's not the path that leads to what I needed to experience. And then I came to this book. Now this had just been released. Always before there was a Polytech Society and that was translated by Englishmen the first part of the 1900s and they were scholars and they were poly scholars but they didn't understand what they were translating. So their choice of words made it difficult to understand. So when Bhikkhu Bodhi came out with this, it was there was a lot of excitement because he used words that you could understand, at least I could. So I got real excited and I started reading the Anapanasati Sutta. And I'd been used to doing mindfulness of breathing meditation for 20 years. So I started doing the Anapanasati Sutta instructions. In the last part of the instructions, it says on the in-breath, you tranquilize a bodily formation. On the out-breath, you tranquilize a bodily formation. What in the world were they talking about? Bodily formation. So I tried a lot of different ways, thinking that it was the entire body and I started relaxing the entire body, but I couldn't do it fast enough on the in-breath and out-breath. So I decided it was something other than that. And I was giving a retreat, loving kindness retreat, to uh, quite a few people at that time. And I was walking from uh, just giving a retreat back to my room. And I started thinking about what does tranquilize a bodily formation mean? And as I was walking and looking at my mind, I started noticing there was a tightness in it. Well, could that be what the Buddha was talking about? So, I relaxed. And I got the shock of my life. There's no more thoughts. My mind was clear. My mind was very alert. And I thought, now, that's really interesting. So I did it again. And I started noticing, well, if there's no thoughts in my mind, and there's no tightness in my mind, I must be letting go of something. Because my mind was exceptionally clear at that time ready to observe whatever else was going to arise. It was there. And I kept doing that for a period of time and decided, well, I wonder what happens if I sit in meditation and try this on the in-breath and out-breath. The first time I sat, and I was used to sitting for long periods of time, I was used to doing a lot of meditation, and I went as deep as they said you can go with meditation. And the first time I sat and I started going, okay, let's try the in-breath and relax and the out-breath and relax. I went deeper in 20 minutes than I had ever experienced in meditation before. My mind just went, And I thought, hmm, that was nice. <laughs> and I started sitting every day doing that. And after a couple of weeks, 
I went to the head monk and I said, I have to go do a self-retreat. I'll be gone a couple of weeks anyway. So I went to Thailand and I, I went to a cave. It was close enough to a village so I could go get alms round and then I could come back. And I got into the habit of reading the suttas and really seeing what it was saying. And then after eating, taking a bath, getting cleaned up, everything was in chip shape, then I would start practicing meditation and I'd sit until maybe midnight. And it was so interesting. It was so incredibly fascinating that at the end of two weeks I couldn't stop. And I wound up staying there for three months. And I would have kept doing it except the head monk sent another monk after me because he wanted me to help at the temple. He sent somebody to come get me, so I had to come back begrudgingly. But the reason that I could understand the suttas is because a Sri Lankan monk had come to the temple where I was at, right after I got this book. And I was teaching loving-kindness meditation. And he, he said, I understand you teach meditation. Tell me how you do it. So I started telling him how I was teaching. And after a while, he stopped me and he said, you know, you're teaching just about right. But you're using the language of the commentary." Now, the commentaries, the Sudhimaga, that's considered the uh, encyclopedia of all meditation for Theravada Buddhists. And when he said, why don't you, instead of using the commentaries, why don't you just put that book away? and simply use the sutta language. Now, always before I tried to read the suttas, I didn't understand them, so I went back to the Visuddhimagga every time. Because I'd studied it for 20 years. I knew what it said. And when he, he actually gave me permission to put down the Visuddhi Maga and just use the suttas, all of a sudden these light bulbs are going off in my head. I knew what they were saying. And I didn't before I put down the Visuddhi Maga. Because it was so much different. I don't know why I got that idea in my head to keep going back to the Visuddhi Maga except that was the way I was trained. <clears throat> so when I put that down and I started reading this, I couldn't put it down. I mean, I read, I read every sutta. I went through all of the suttas. I started seeing, ah, this is talking about doing the meditation this way. It says it more than one time. So I think it might, might be something to it. The instructions in the Anapanasati Sutta and the Visuddhi Ma and, and the uh, Satipatthana Sutta are word for word, letter for letter, exactly the same instructions. Well, that's interesting because I'd been told that if you practice Anapanasati, that leads to uh, psychic abilities. So you have to practice what it says in the Satipatthana Sutta. And how much sense did that make when they're exactly the same instruction? 
So putting down the Visuddhi Magga and going back to uh, the suttas and I started reading some of the suttas to the people I was teaching and all of a sudden their progress in the meditation started becoming really fast. I mean, in a weekend retreat, some people would get into the first jhana in a weekend. That had never been done before, as far as I knew. Well, there's something special about this. And the more I studied this, the more I really got into, well, that's what the Buddha is talking about. And you have to understand what craving is. You have to understand how to see it. And you have to understand how to let it go. But I, I had experimented enough with this tightness in my head. I started seeing every time there's tightness there, that craving was there. And every time I let it go, it was like expansion happening in my mind, and my mind became peaceful. So the suttas are my teacher. And actually, I'm not a Theravada monk. I am a Suttavada monk. And that was one of the early sects of Buddhism, after the Buddha died. So now I'm, re I'm bringing it back. I'm bringing back Suttavada. The Suttavadans, they didn't have anything to do with Abhidhamma. They weren't interested in Abhidhamma. They were interested in Navinya, rules, for monks, which has a lot of instruction in it, and the suttas themselves. So, that's a story I haven't told for a long time. <laughs> Buddhist psychology. But if you stay in the suttas, it means the practice of the higher dhamma, which means the practice of jhana and insight together. Now, a lot of you have been telling me about the insights that you've had with your meditation. I don't make a big deal out of it because they're personal and there's just observations. I used to do it this way and now I see that it causes me pain. I'm not going to do it that way anymore. I say, wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> there is real personality development when you practice the way I'm showing you. There's change that happens. You stop letting go of so many things that cause you pain and you start developing the way that doesn't have any pain in it. And life starts to be more fun when you do that. It's real important. Okay. <laughs> Lady, what is the counterpart of pleasant feeling? Friend Visaka, painful feeling is the counterpart of pleasant feeling. What is the counterpart of pleasant feeling? What is the counterpart of painful feeling? Excuse me. Pleasant feeling is the counterpart of painful feeling. What is the counterpart of neither painful nor pleasant feeling? 
Ignorance is the counterpart of neither painful nor pleasant feeling. What is the counterpart of ignorance? True knowledge is the counterpart of ignorance. What is the counterpart of true knowledge? Deliverance is the counterpart of true knowledge. What is the counterpart of deliverance? Nibbana is the counterpart of deliverance. Lady, what is the counterpart of Nibbana? Oops. Friend Visaka, you have pushed this line of questioning <laughs> too far. You were not able to grasp the limit to questions. For the holy life, friend Visaka, is grounded in Nibbana culminates in Nibbana, ends in Nibbana. If you wish, friend Visaka, go to the Blessed One and ask him about the meaning of this. As the Blessed One explains it to you, you should remember it. Then the lay follower Visaka, having delighted and rejoiced in the Bhikkhu Dhammadina's Words rose from his seat after paying homage to him, keeping her on his right. He went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told the Blessed One his entire conversation with the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina. When she finished speaking, the Blessed One said this, The Bhikkhu Dhammadina is wise, Visaka. The Bhikkhuni Dhammadina has great wisdom. If you had asked me the meaning of this, I would have explained it to you in exactly the same way that the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina has explained it. Such is its meaning and you should remember it. That is what the Blessed One said. The lay follower Visaka was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. <clears throat> the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina, she, she was a very highly recognized Dhamma speaker. And just about every time I give that sutta, all the women start going. <laughs> yeah, we can do that too. And I say to you, yes, you can. Come and practice. Okay, so I've been talking for a long time again. Do you have any questions? Not the way you're talking about it. You have a tendency for lust for pleasant feelings. You start looking for pleasant feelings to happen. That is the underlying tendency to lust. Just like you try to run away from painful feelings. That's the underlying tendency to aversion. But is that tendency sankara? Is that the word for it? I mean, no. Sankara is different, although Sankara is one of the biggest words in Pali. It covers a lot of stuff, but not that. Yeah? Can we put the six R's on the top? It came from a guy, Mark Berger, 2005. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, you remember when we had a retreat in Julian yes. and there was a black guy that was there <coughs> and he was doing the meditation and he handed me a little note and said, this actually is what you're teaching. And it was uh, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. It was only five. And later on, I added 
recognize. But that was, that was a very interesting thing, and I wish I remember his name so I could give him credit for it. But he, he was a, a very astute and observer of, yeah, this is what it is. I didn't use it for a long time. But one day I was telling Kema about, well, this is the way you practice, and I told her about it, and she started getting excited, so I started using it. So what did you use it for? Uh, drops, don't resist or push, soften and smile. I used to do that all the time. I don't know. The words recognize and release are the second part of my yapa. That's the translation if I understand. First first is recognize. Second is release and relax. Third is re-smile and return. And fourth is repeat. Oh, how, how they correspond yeah. to the six R's. That's what, yeah, 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 yeah. So you recognize the state, whether it's... Right, you recognize an unwholesome state when it arises. That's a disturbance or a hindrance, or whatever it is that arises. And then you have to release by not keeping your attention on it and relax. Then bring up the wholesome. Resmile, return, then the last one, repeat. Stay with your object of meditation as long as you can. <coughs> and just that by itself, it brings to question a lot of people that tell you to watch it until it goes away, or note it until it goes away, because that's not right effort. Right effort is very clear. Recognize when an unwholesome state arises, release it and relax. Bring up a wholesome state, stay with a wholesome state. That's right effort. But watching something until it goes away, especially if you don't have a relaxed step in there, is the development of one-pointed concentration, which does not lead to understanding how dependent origination works and does not lead to Nibbana. <laughs>